it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Hilda Cronwright from the NSA Group. She's going to talk to us about kimberlite indicator mineral and micro diamond techniques as applied to the diamond exploration. Now she did her geology at Pretoria and her chemistry, I think through uh, UNISA. Mm -hmm. And she is currently the laboratory manager and technical signatory of the NSA Group. Over to you, Hilda. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I suspect you are seeing my presentation, yeah? Um, yeah, as I say, so the MSA group is a geological consultancy in Johannesburg, and apart from doing a consultation for mining clients on all commodities, we also have a specialized lab that um, specializes in diamond analytical testing. So my um, talk, I'm going to talk a lot, a lot of my talk will overlap with uh, what Profanus for UNES discussed with the formation of diamonds and also um, Dr. Mark David overview of diamond sampling techniques. So that's um, quite a nice addition to, um, to my talk. And then Dr. Grutter will discuss in much more detail the mineral chemistry interpretation of kimberlite indicator minerals. So for this talk, um, I'm going to discuss what uh, we at MSA do for our clients that want to do diamond exploration um, on the kimberlite indicator mineral sorting side, mineral chemistry, and then also on the micro diamond analysis side, um, and then a few applications. So our laboratory is ISO 1705 accredited and um, for two methods, the heavy mineral analysis, which we call HMA, and then also the micro diamond method. Uh, this is our laboratory. We've seen some nice pictures of kimberlite indicators so far and also micro diamonds, and I'll show some more photographs. Um, Mike has also um, shown a very nice um, diamond exploration pipeline where we as MSA fit in, we slot in wherever the client needs us. We can either start with a desktop study. Um, normally by then they have an exploration license, so we would either accompany him to the field to do sampling to ensure that it's done under controlled circumstances and a sample chain of custody is assured. Um, MSA geology department can also assist with two physical surveys or a large follow-up sampling programs. And then whether, um, so this is obviously then, not many of our clients can do these large regional surveys like uh, De Beers has had the luxury to do in the 60s and still. Um, I had some nice clients from Sierra Leone and uh, Liberia, but uh, no one really has the budget to do those large scale exploration programs. But um, sometimes they already know where the kimberlite is and then we can start the work from there. Uh, this is just a bit of a flow chart. I don't think you'll see all the details. Um, sometimes the, the projects are so small that we might even, um, once the client has found its kimberlite, uh, he, he wants to know if there's a diamond potential. The cost of doing kimberlite indicator sorting and mineral chemistry sometimes equals just doing a box sample for microdiamond analysis. So sometimes for them to get a quick answer, we, we jump directly to microdiamond analysis. But the stepwise process is normally followed to uh, minimize spend up front and after every step um, decide if it's worthwhile to carry on with the next step. So this is where our HMA lab fits in, the recovery of indicator minerals. And as Mike has mentioned, your um, sampling is very important and labeling of your samples are very important. And this is just some examples of very well labeled samples sealed with security tags and um, in many cases, we either um, ensure that we take the samples and bring it back to the lab, or we seal it in the field and the client um, just ships it or gets it over the country border. Uh, this is just an example of how not to label your samples. Uh, this specific batch of samples, the uh, paper labels got wet. You couldn't see the XY coordinate. There was no XL list to accompany it. And I effectively recommend it to the client that we don't even bother analyzing it. Uh, sometimes we uh, start our process with the client even before he knows if he's drilling into a kimberlite and then we can assist with doing kimberlite petrography just to confirm that it is a kimberlite because it could even be a dwyka or a, a weathered basalt. Uh, preferably we need drill core samples or hand specimens, but we have even done thin sections on percussion drill chips. Um, and our heavy mineral analysis method can work on soils, which is preferable, or even on rock samples. Then we just add a stepwise crushing step to liberate the kimberlite indicator minerals and then um, sort them by hand. So um, we've heard a lot uh, many times now what is the definition of a 
kimberlite indicator. It's a pathfinder mineral because it occurs in higher concentrations than your actual um, diamond. And uh, as, as Mike and Mem showed, you get these different purple, red, orange garnets, bright green chrome dioxides, ilmenites and spinels, which are for me just black grains, but my sorters have got decades of experience to distinguish them. And as we said, the kimberlite is just a volcano that brings these mantle minerals up to the surface, um, which will then hopefully tell you if there's diamonds um, associated with it. So in our case, we receive samples um, from the clients and then we send it for a subcontracted lab um, to do heavy mineral concentration. Uh, we do also um, recommend using rather jigs or field bands but, and not gold banning in the field. Rather, if you have the budget for career fees, rather transport your sample to the lab and so that we can do the heavy mineral concentration under controlled circumstances. Um, with the lab first do, do wet screening to recover the plus 0.3 to minus 2 millimeter size fraction. And then it gets concentrated in these funnels using uh, tetrabroma ethane with a density of 2.96. The concentrate is then also acid bleached with either a weak HCl solution or oxalic acid to remove iron oxides so that we can get a concentrate suitable for sorting to distinguish the kimberlite indicator minerals. Um, so we, uh, each grain need to be um, sorted by hand and we then uh, recover these uh, through kimberlite, kimberlite indicator minerals from other unrelated heavy background minerals, for example, igneous um, spinels and metamorphic garnets. Um, all the data for the sorting data are recorded and captured on uh, Excel spreadsheets. The kimberlite indicators are removed and mounted on cards for storage or for further work like mineral chemistry analysis. And we write a mineral um, a detailed report that describes the number of garnets found and um, colors of the garnets. Here are some more colors of all the different garnets we find and the color of presentative garnets um, very, very often with the average chromium content, which is the, related to, to the crystallization conditions in the mantle, for example, the depth, the temperature, and also the composition, composition of the mantle at that point. Um, MSA also has um, analysts that specialize in surface texture analysis. This um, gives valuable information of the transport distance if the primary kimberlite is not yet found. Um, and you can determine if they're local or far traveled. For example, fresh grains with diagnostic remnants of the kimberlitic affinity, these ones still have pieces of kimberlite stuck to it. We call it REMK, remnant of kimberlite, or remnant of kilophyte. Kilophyte is like a reaction rim on garnet that forms in the kimberlite magma or melt, which is a very fragile coating on the garnet. And if that is still present on your grains, you can be sure that you are, still, you are quite close to your source. Uh, once that, that kilophyte rim erodes off, you also get what we call a primary surface, a sculptured surface, which um, also shows the grain is quite fresh. But when your grains start looking like this, you are hundreds of kilometers away from source because this is, for example, how garnets and ilmenites look on the west coast of South Africa. It tells you nothing of where your primary source are. Um, for ilmenites, you get two different kinds, uh, massive ilmenites showing no internal structure or polygranular, ilmenites having a microcrystalline or aggregated appearance, and they're also quite fragile, so if you see them, you are closer to source. And then uh, there are many other different kinds of uh, ilmenites with sculptured surfaces where there's a blocky, pimpled structure um, surface, or also a reaction rim called perovskite. The perovskite mantle is the one the grain that is quite fresh. Um, this is just some other pictures of um, kimberlitic spinels. Um, this terminology of the different gloss silky taut has been established by De Beers, um, and my predecessor, Owen Garvey, literally wrote the book on surface textures. And this terminology is um, standard throughout De Beers and MSA because our sorters are all trained by De Beers. And um, they have got the skills to distinguish these things, whereas for me, that still look like little black grains, but they can be sure that those are non kimberlitic spinels. And the sorters have got the visual skills to dis discriminate between these things, as you don't have the budget to analyze every single grain by microprobe. Um, some nice pictures of fresh planet that I've seen, also showing sculptured surfaces. And then also they can get weathered quite quickly. These ones still have pieces remnant of kimberlite on, and uh, they not often signal that the, um, your kimberlite source is near. 
as they don't survive um, chemical or physically, physical weathering so well. These ones are more abraded and then they can also get biogenetically altered in the soil profile in situ or post-depositional biogenesis. I mean, olivines, you also have primary surfaces and they also get weathered quite quickly. So um, after we've reported the heavy mineral analysis results, if a suitable number of chemolite indicators are recovered, the next step would be to do mineral chemistry analysis of a selection of these chems to determine diamond potential, diamond potential. So we submitted to the spectral analytical facility at the University of Johannesburg, where they um, provide the mineral chemistry analysis of 10 major uh, element oxides. And this can then help you to prioritize your exploration spend. If you have several targets, then you know which one to, to do further work on. So UJ performs mounting of the grains in epoxy and polishes for um, EMP analysis. And this is just an enlarged photograph of the grain mount that they send us, where every single grain has got a unique grain number and the mineral chemistry analysis is reported in Excel spreadsheet. So um, obviously the, the Kimberlite 101 education that I often have to give my clients when they get very excited when they see Kimberlite indicators in their samples, but they don't yet know that not all Kimberlites contain diamond. This is just a simple picture show you that they need to sample the mantle at a depth and temperature suitable for diamonds to have formed. And courtesy of Prof. Yun, who had this nice picture from Maggie Newman, um, the pressure temperature diamond window sits in this cold, deep keels of cratons, and you need your kimberlite to sample that full lithospheric group of the continent to um, stand a chance of diamonds to have been formed. And then never mind the fact that the kimberlite is just a taxi that brings it up to surface. Here are just some other um, plots that we've seen before in other um, presentations um, about the diamond stability field. And then also the IUGS classification of ultramafic rocks um, containing mostly olivine, um, ferromagnesium pyroxene, orthopyroxene, or uh, calcium uh, clinopyroxene. And then we'll see on the next plots where your periodic um, Rock types can either fall in the lazulite or hardstockite field, depending on the um, CPX, OPX, and olivine content. So this is the old traditional uh, plot derived by um, Gurney, I would suppose, that plotted all the garnet inclusions in diamonds and then um, mapped out the pyrogenesis of where these uh, garnets originated in the mantle. Um, as garnet is the most important indicator in diamond exploration. So um, the chemical composition of your pyro garnet is characteristic of the mantle conditions and, and, and indicates the pyrogenesis. And this is just another plot of that with a, um, with a showing a diamond with a garnet inclusion, courtesy of uh, John Gurney. And um, this field here is known as the G10D field, where they found inclusions in diamonds. Um, so for MSAs, mineral chemistry reporting, we use this garnet classification plot, uh, courtesy of Dr. Grutter, and um, all the different kinds of garnets can be seen here. This is just an example of uh, appliance data um, with the chrome and calcium contents. And the low calcium, high chrome mineral chemistry is classified as G10 or G10D, and it's highly indicative that this cumulite sampled the mantle in the diamond stability field. And then sometimes to just explain this uh, relation between chrome content and depth of formation, I've superimposed this image of isobars, which are lines of equal pressure at a given temperature, also from a, a Gritter publication using a P38 uh, barometer, I think. Um, this is all academic. Um, and it shows you that the deeper you go into the um, mantle, you cross the di graphite diamond uh, conversion field and your garnet there show that they crystallize under quite high deep, uh, deeper pressure conditions. Another plot that we often use is um, for the low chrome garnets, the one that ones that plots here at the bottom. Oh, and incidentally, um, the, these purple colors, they were all mauve colored garnets and the orange plots were all orange colored garnets. So on the next plot where I just plot this low chrome garnet, 
the titanium versus sodium plot can discriminate um, between megacrysts and peridotitic or eclogetic garnet. So if they contain relatively low titanium and sodium more than 0.07%, it is possible that the eclogetic source was sampled, which is rare, but often a source of unusually high diamond content. Um, some other mineral chemistry we do for ilmenite, it's not necessarily telling us much about the diamond potential, but it does confirm if it is a chemolytic ilmenite or not when you're still doing regional um, surveys. Um, ilmenite obviously occurs as a characteristic mineral in group one kimberlites and really within group twos. Like I said, you can be, it can either be megacrysts or macrocrysts um, or polygranular. And this is one of the plots that we use, titanium against magnesium, and there's a clear distinction between kimberlytic ilmenites and non-kimberlytic ilmenites. So if you have a regional survey and you um, analyze your ilmenites, you can then um, identify where is your, what populate, if you have different populations of ilmenites and then zone in on the more prospective looking um, sample localities. But the relationship of ilmenite to diamond is indirect because inclusions within diamond are extremely rare. This is just another plot that sometimes gets used to show the oxygen, oxygen fugacity conditions that um, was in the kimberlite melt, which um, relate to diamond preservation. So on this uh, stage four, you have good preservation of your diamonds. In this first stage, you might have no preservation of diamonds. Spinel is another very important mineral that gets used for mineral chemistry interpretation. Unfortunately, there is several populations of spinel that overlap. The non-kimberlytic field overlap with um, unicrysts, the spinel that crystallize from the mantle, and phenocrysts, spinel that crystallize from the kimberlite mount itself. And this dog leg shape from the overlapping mineral chemistry fields is what's um, typical in uh, chromites that come from strongly diamond diamondiferous kimberlites. What you also want to see is that diamond inclusion field where your chromite is um, higher than 60%. So on the next plot, uh, this is a, a plot we use in our reports, and this client's data didn't really follow this dog leg population, and there were also very few chromites um, above 60% chromite, um, chrome dioxide, um, but hopefully it does mean that there is some um, chromite bearing peridotite source in the upper mantle that was sampled by this kimberlite. And then there's another plot uh, that we use for spinels, which is chrome against magne magnesium and the diamond inclusion fields have been mapped by uh, previous um, experts. And um, in our case, this was used to plot our client's data and a few chromites fall in or near this high chrome diamond inclusion field. And this indicates that at least some of the chromites originate from a diamond different source with respect to chromite bearing peridotite in the upper mantle. Um, I just want to sidetrack a bit. Uh, uh, clients often want you to give you give them the best answer for the least amount of money, and you try and not analyze too many grains up front, but there is a danger of analyzing too few. For example, there's a, a publication about how De Beers discovered the AK6 kimberlite in 1970s, but the early evaluation showed it was sub-economic because they didn't find many um, P10 uh, of low calcium micro and garnet. So, so they left it and then uh, sold their share. And then Lucara did more work and, and, and some more grains were analyzed and suddenly a population of more garnet in this area became evident, 1,700 grains. So for me and my clients, I have been in situations where they only had budget to analyze 200 grains and I was skeptical and I said, let's hope we see something. And then the danger exists that you get a plot with a big population P9s and one point there, and then you don't know if it's an analytical error or if it's a real population starting to come out. So for now, I've actually set the minimum grain to analyze 400, and so far that's put well. Uh, some more examples of um, chem, chem data that we've done for, for clients. Um, in this case, the location of the, um, the Kimberly deposit was slab bang in the center of the copper craton very nice high chrome, low calcium garnets. In this case, client was very excited in the southeast of Lesotho, very nice colored garnets. 
but unfortunately they were all G9s and none of them in the G10 field, and there were also no eclogetic components in his um, eclogetic harness, so there was no eclogetic harness. This one had, had a bit of an eclogetic com component as well. So the value and the benefit of uh, doing heavy mineral analysis to find these kimberlite indicators is to fast track the discovery of new diamond mines, but also remember that negative kimberlite indicator results in exploration samples also save you time and cost because it reduces your, your area of interest. Um, you need to look at your surface features of your kims um, to distinguish if they're grains of local origin or from distal origins. Um, especially when you want to do mineral chemistry analysis, it's no use analyzing very well grounded graded grains. Um, also, mineral chemistry um, can confirm if your indicators are of kimberlitic origin or of non crustal sources, uh, which hardly affects us. We, we have an 80% plus um, accuracy rate with distinguishing visual, visually distinguished kimberlitic grains. Um, and then the mineral chemistry data can provide information if your chems originated in the diamond stability field. And then in this case, identify high interest targets with diamond potential from low interest targets that are potentially banned. So moving on in the diamond exploration pipeline, if your diamond potential looks positive after completing the mineral chemistry analysis of some chems, one can then proceed and do the micro diamond analysis of a mini bulk sample confirm the presence of diamond. So a mini bulk sample in this case is 200 kilograms or less. Uh, I wouldn't go with less than 100 kilograms, um, but it's still cheaper than either drilling a large diameter drill sample or trenching or putting a plant up on site. So in this case, microdiamond analysis is a very cost-effective first-stage approach of characterizing a cumulative target to confirm whether a newly discovered cumulative body, if nothing else is known about it before, is barren or diamondiferous. So it can evaluate and rank your targets to determine if there's merit in spending additional funds on advanced exploration, for example, drilling, bulk sampling, or processing via trenching or large diameter drilling. Or it can recommend a walk away decision early on. Again, the danger is um, you're not going to open a mine after doing one 200 kilogram sample. I always have to be careful um, saying to clients that you can determine the, the micro diamond grade possibly, um, but it is a a fast lab-based solution to testing if your kimberlite has got diamonds in or not. Um, so just to give you an idea how small the micro diamonds are that we look at versus sugar grain, that's a salt grain, and that is a micro diamond, um, probably 150 or 106 microns. Um, and we go down to 75 microns. So um, each and every micro diamond that we recover from our samples um, are described in terms of color, clarity, um, crystal features, and it can be used to fingerprint your diamond population sample by your kimberlite, and may even be an early stage indication of what your macro diamond might look like. And then, like I said, I'm careful to promise clients too much too soon, but if enough stones are recovered, for example, at least 200 stones from a 200 kilogram sample, then the size frequency distribution can be modeled to predict a very early macro diamond grade. And then later when mining commences, the micro diamond analysis method can also be used to characterize the different cumulite phases or domains further in terms of the different micro diamond content and diamond crystal features. So the micro diamond method of, of MSA, um, we first established our first caustic fusion prep facility with SGS at the Boysons um, site in Johannesburg South in 2006. And when SGS closed in 2016, MSA sourced another subcontractor, MinMet Equipment, to process our microdiamond samples by caustic fusion dissolution. They custom built their facility exclusively for MSA, and MSA's microdiamond lab is the only independent ISO accredited commercial caustic fusion and microdiamond lab in Africa one of only a few in the world. I know Canada has got a few, but we're the only one in Africa. So the MinMet facility is containerized to be able to increase capacity in a few weeks, and it can even be moved to remote sites if necessary. Incidentally, they, was, they were contracted by Indiama um, last year to build a caustic fusion lab for the National Diamond Laboratory of Angola. Um, to process the, uh, Angola's own exploration samples, but and according to news reports, they were commissioned in late, April, late April, but there's no mention of any QC, QC processes in place. 
Uh, this is just some images of where sample receipt happens and the drying. No crushing of samples is undertaken to minimize the risk of breaking diamonds. And then diamonds are highly resistant to caustic soda. And therefore, the risk of diamond etching or, or damage is negligible. So a sample size of up to 20 kilograms, um, aliquot size can be processed overnight with um, caustic soda. It gets heated. And then this uh, fused sludge is poured through a screen with a bottom cutoff of 75 microns. The sludge is neutralized with acid and dried. And MSA receives this caustic um, residue on, a, on the screen uh, after it's dried for sorting. So in general, like I said, we, we recommend to process a sample weighing at least 200 kilograms. It's an expensive method, um, but at least you have diamonds to show for it at the end, unlike kimberlite indicator mineral chemistry, where it's an indirect um, indication of diamond potential. The micro diamond analysis will actually give you the diamonds. Um, so the sample weight reduction is quite significant. That's why we can sort through a five kilogram or smaller little residue and we sort through them um, grain by grain to recover all the micro diamonds. And this is just a, a petri dish of some of the larger diamonds that you can see visually, and they get very small. Um, each and every stone is measured and described. Stones larger than 300 microns are weighed individually, and stones smaller than 300 microns are weighed in groups per sieve class. And then the micro diamonds are stored on a sample card after weighing and the data is captured for each individual stone and appended to the Excel uh, as an Excel file to the MIDA report. Um, so as part of our quality control to ensure that um, all the diamonds are recovered and that um, we can assure the quality of the results, we add a known quantity of synthetic diamond uh, spikes or QC spikes at the beginning of the caustic fusion process. And the recovery statistics, I'll show a plot of that just now, and this is um, some of the plus 300 to minus uh, 425 micron spikes and uh, minus 106 plus 75 microns you can't even see on this image, but there are 20 of them on that in that um, size of the hole of, on the middle card. So the QC spikes are sized synthetic diamonds that are perfectly cuboctahedral and have a distinctly distinctive yellow color. We add them to, in various size fractions. And um, the spike recovery efficiency is report in the, reported in the MIDA report. And our target of 90% recovery is set as the minimum quality requirement for our ISO accredited method. So over the years, uh, since 2006, our spike recovery on average has been 97%. And yeah, I just need to mention, sometimes we also find synthetic diamonds released into the sample from diamond drilling or core cutting blades. Um, we call them client spikes. And we also report them. It can be quite significant if your client, if your core drilling was done with diamond drill bits. Um, if you are involved early on in the process, ensure that your diamond drill bit is made of synthetic diamonds, because if it is natural or industrial diamonds, we would not be able to distinguish them from the natural diamonds in your actual kimberlite. And this becomes very important when you are analyzing your kimberlite for the very first time. Obviously, once you start mining, then you know there are um, diamonds. But for an exploration sample, you need to not have any ambiguity if these diamonds were contamination from your drill bit or if it is naturally from your kimberlite. So um, that, if possible, we recommend a tungsten carbide drill bit. Um, but I understand that that can't really work well in hard, competent rock um, without using a percussion or hammer action, which then stand the risk of breaking your diamonds. So. Um, if possible, try not to draw with diamond drill bits. Or if you do, use synthetic diamond drill bits. And this is just a picture of some of the real diamonds we find by sorting. And then this is the ultra micro balance that we use to weigh the micro diamonds. They, um, we weigh at seven decimal digits. Um, and also this balance gets verified, the accuracy gets verified with calibrated mass pieces on a daily basis. And this is just one of the control charts where the one milligram standard weight was weighed over time with its certified limits. So once all the microdiamonds are recovered out of the sample, they are screened in um, a, set, a set of Tyler sheath classes from uh, 2.12 millimeters down to um, 75 microns. And the most common diamond size distribution is log normal. Um, 
hence uh, diamond size data requires a log transform for meaning data interpretation and data analysis. So this is just a um, picture of the sieve shaker that we use to screen the diamonds in the different size passes. And this is just a graphical representation of um, several samples with uh, more abundant small stones and fewer large stones, as can be seen here. So every, each stone is then described in terms of color, clarity, crystal shape, resorption, for example, from an octet to a dodec, as um, Prof. Yunus discussed, and also if it contains any inclusions or if we can see any visible surface features. Um, in this case, there's some different colors, brown, yellow, whites, and blues, obviously not um, microdiamonds, photographs from the internet. And then also crystal shapes, we would classify them in terms of if it's a macro, a, a dodecahedron, a broken dodecahedron or octahedron, or even sometimes a fragment if we can't see any um, primary crystal features remaining on the stone. Um, and here yeah, are just some more real stones that we've recovered and photographed. Um, so the, micro, the, the importance of the microdiamonds classification is, like I said, it can characterize your micropopulation if it's our gem quality or both, and it may even give an indication of your appearance or your quality of your macro stone. Prof. Yun spoke a bit about the primary crystal uh, shapes of um, diamonds that reflect their formation environment. For example, octahedron forms under slow crystallization, under high temperatures and low carbon saturation. And, uh, but if you find in your kimberlite a diamond suite exhibiting numerous primary morphologies, you can therefore interpret it to represent numerous populations of diamonds from different and distinct sources within the planet. This makes it more complex, obviously, minus one day. And then also octaves can get resorbed into dodecahedrons, and this resorption can take off a minimum of 45% of your original mass and volume of your diamond. And then these are some um, of the crystal features, um, common surface features seen on octus, or for example, trigons on the octahedral face and hexagonal pits that follow the crystal structures. And then on dodecahedrons, um, you can have lamination lines and uh, zigzag patterns or terraces and all that uh, we describe as much as what we can see. Then for the purpose of the microdiamond re report, we um, summarize the crystal shapes and colors in these uh, typical pie charts. And you can see what your predominant um, crystal shape can be, for example, in this case, not that many, um, also quite a few octaves and broken octaves, but even more dodecahedrons and, bro and, bro and broken dodecahedrons. And then uh, quite a 15% por portion of fragments which can either be due to natural, that happens naturally during diamond emplacement, or kimberlite emplacement, because diamond is um, inherently unstable at uh, surface temperatures and pressures, but it can also be due to drilling, um, just bad luck. So the benefits of um, microdiamond analysis, like I said, it's a first stage cost-effective evaluation of kimberlites before you go into bulk sampling, um, and it, um, establish whether your newly discovered kimberlite body is barren or diamondiferous, and it helps prioritize targets for bulk sampling or walk away decisions. And uh, we often see clients doing microdiamond analysis when they want an independent um, report with MSA's accredited, accredited results on to use that as proof to go get further funding. Um, because often historical reports of diamonds being found in a specific kimberlite, uh, you can't trust that there's no chain of custody um, and the invest, potential investor will rather um, give them funding if they have an independent um, report confirming the diamond content. Um, like I said, it can also establish the diamond content of different kimberlite phases or domains or facies um, in your kimberlite when you start um, getting the geological model going. And it can also give you an idea of the micropopulations of diamonds that can give you an idea of what your macro stones will look like. And then should sufficient diamonds be recovered, the size frequency distribution can be modeled to predict the macro diamond grade and a large stone frequency distribution information. Um, then I just want to go quickly through um, two or three case studies or uh, applications of the data. Um, normally we don't have the um, 
this was a presentation I did shortly after joining MSA, where MSA was involved in updating a mineral resource estimate for the um, Karoi mine. Um, so Karoi or the AK-6 is part of the Rapa Kimberlite field. And in 2010, MSA completed the NI-43101 report and then revised the resource estimate in 2013 when um, diamonds actually became, production data became available. So they wanted to update the mineral resource estimate. Um, and the, the talk is a lot more complex because they even compared how the prediction of the type two diamonds that they predicted um, then turned out in reality. So in this case, I just want to compare, compare the, um, the model based uh, the the size frequency or log probability um, model on the x-axis is the size of diamonds and on the y-axis is the probability of exceeding a certain size. For example, finding a 10 carat stone is only like 0.01%, uh, but finding a 0.1 carat stone somewhere in here increases to about 20%. Um, so this was the model generated on um, micro diamond data in red, and then in blue is the production data. Um, so, they, so that's the microdiamond model, and then they simulate the, simulate the macrodiamond model. Um, the offset of these graphs, it gets very technical, has got to do with um, the bottom cutoff size, and you're not looking at the same population of diamonds and things like that. Um, I'll associate um, uh, to explain this in detail to me. It's not my forte. Um, and then, so, as I said, subsequent to the commencement of production at Karoi in April 2012, it was possible to compare this microdiamond model with the model of real production data. And in this case, this was the actual microdiamonds found, and then blue is the actual macrodiamonds that was find, found. And um, what was found that the microdiamond model and the, macro, and the production data fits the size frequency distribution quite closely. Um, what also was uh, interesting to see was that this microdiamond model predicted diamond breakage during um, large diamond drilling and the processing steps. It had a negative impact on the um, on the model of the of the microdiamonds. So it shows that the microdiamonds can produce a more reliable size frequency distribution on which the grade and revenue estimates can be made. For example, in this chart, the um, red was the SFD model derived from microdiamonds, and in blue was the um, SFD of the macrodiamonds from large diameter drilling. And there's a, a difference there, which was due to um, diamond breakage. The microdiamonds predicted a coarser size frequency distribution. Um, and in other words, there was an under recovery of large stones, probably during breakage during drilling or large diameter large diameter drilling samples, yeah. So it will have a revenue implications and then the large diameter size, large diameter drilling model, size frequency distribution was flawed. It leads to underestimation of the average grade and value per carat of the pipe. Um, then I also in 2018, did a presentation at the uh, SIMM Diamond Source to Use Conference. Um, usually MSA, I don't have the, opportunity to present science data, but this information was presented by Matami Mining and James Campbell, which was the, who was the co-author, and he's the managing director of Botswana Diamonds. And this is where they used um, heavy mineral analysis, MinChem data, and microdiamonds data to assist them in making rapid technical and economical economic decisions. Um, so the Frischgewacht Dijk is in the uh, Limpopo province, is currently being explored by um, Botswana Diamonds. Um, and this is some historical MinChem data. In the bottom right was MinChem data that we um, did for them in 2014 and comparing it with Klipspringer and Marsfontein, which are two uh, very rich um, Kimberlite deposits also in Limpopo. And early on already, they could see there were many subcalcic and high chrome garnets in this. Um, in the G10 and G10D fields. In the following plot, you could also see that, that there was a, um, a large proportion of eclogetic type garnets, which suggested a strong eclogetic diamond pyrogenesis. 
Um, and when they did the uh, surface sampling program, it unfortunately yielded insufficient macro diamonds for valuation and resource estimation. But combined with the micro diamond data, they could get an early estimation of the total carrot content. And this project um, illustrates how micro diamond data was crucial for a preliminary valuation. And then obviously they went on to further um, sampling after this. Um, an interesting um, comparison that I could make out of the data that they reported was a comparison of macro diamonds versus micro diamonds. Um, they reported 83 macro diamonds. Um, this diamond crystal shapes was classified by um, Ralph Ferraris. And then this is the micro diamond analysis that MSA did. And just as a general comparison, you could see that the uh, um, that uh, they were mostly dodecahedral shapes and um, it, it dominated both populations. And then there was a smaller population of octahedra and macros, um, but we had neither macros or micros had any cubic crystals. And this supports an early stage observation that the micro diamond crystal shapes can give an indication of your macro diamond crystal shapes. Um, obviously, to be verified with additional micro diamond and macro diamond sampling um, studies. And then also I had a bit of a, a, a experimental um, method development um, test to see if I could do the diamond typing analysis on mic micro diamonds. So um, on some of the Botswana diamond um, stones, I had some analysis done at Mintec, or I did it myself because it's quite a, a finicky process to mount these micro diamonds to get the FDRR analysis. So FDRR was mentioned by um, Prof. Yun. It's responsible for determining whether or not the diamond contains nitrogen and also the aggregation state of nitrogen if present. So um, the FDIR analysis um, was done and I could go down to 150 microns. Uh, normally it's done on macro diamonds, but I managed to get a spectra for an, uh, 150. And there is an example of where we suspect this might be an early indication of a type two diamond without any nitrogen peaks. Unfortunately, uh, the Mintec FDRR instrument is no longer operational due to a computer upgrade that's no longer compatible with old hardware. So I need to find out from Prof. Yun where does he have his FDRR analysis done as presented in his presentation. Um, the nearest person I could find that might help is someone in Israel, which would not be um, very practical to send samples there. And that is the end of talk. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Okay, any guys with questions, feel free to put your hand up and just to unmute and talk to Hilda. You know, um, I'll just kick off with, uh, you know, asking, um, do, you, do they still use um, less durable heavy minerals as an indicator or to track down when you're in the proximity of a pipe? Whether they can, you know, if, they've, if they've got a sniff in the nose like this, like goxicide, you know, the barium aluminium variety that doesn't, it weathers very fast. So when you find that with the heavy minerals associated with diamonds, then you know you're very close to the to the source. Are they still using that kind of technology? Sorry, just repeat, what's that mineral type you mentioned? Goxicide, barium aluminium, BALAL3. I can honestly not say we've looked for that one specifically. <laughs> I don't know. But do you, but do, you do, do you, what I'm, it doesn't matter which one actually, it's just a, a rapid weathering mineral that's not necessarily associated with diamonds as such, but it's found in association with the, uh, the diamond differs, uh, you know, mineral. Yeah. I, I've not heard that um, of that mineral. And, and I don't know if it's a mineral routinely sorted by the Beersh even, hence why my sorters don't have the skill to identify it. Um, Any, I'd like to ask you a question on Gorg Sig site. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I have found it in every single alluvial diamond deposit, basically worldwide. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on where it yep. comes from? Well, you see, we found it uh, you know, in, in the north of the Macquarie, and the beers at that point in time said, look, because it's such a rapid weathering heavy mineral, uh, we, we must be very close to, you know, to either a dike swarm or, you know, a, a diamond bearing horizon. Uh, hence, I thought 
I left soon after that, so I, I was wondering whether that would be incorporated in, in exploration, you know, to fast track them to get them closer to the source of, of the pipe at the time. I, I have found gorksite in alluvials that are thousands of kilometers away from primary sources. Yeah, as I say, it's not necessarily associated with, and that's why I say, you know, I, I don't know how it developed as a tool, because when they did find it, they say, look, this this mineral weathers fast, and to find it within your your sample that shows that they, that you know you are on the right track, they thought that would give them some indication of how close to the pipe they were. I, I honestly am that's not. As much as I know. That's why I'm just okay. asking. We the must chat about further that. about that offline because yeah. I'm fascinated okay. by gold six lights. Okay. Yeah, we can we can do a paper on that one. <laughs> Hilda, who who else is is providing um, micro diamond work and similar work to you up in the big wide world? I guess mostly the Canadians, is it? Are you meaning our clients or who else does? No, no, no just, just laboratory services. Yeah. I guess Herman uh, can answer that as well. Thanks, SRC in Saskatchewan. Yeah. And then uh, one or two other labs in Canada. Yeah, and obviously De Beers has still got their, their um, micro diamond lab in Kimberley. Yeah. HF facility, uh, highly hazardous. Not that caustic is not as, as pleasant. It's very. Um, Noxious to stand close by without full body protection, but at least not it won't kill the whole town. Mm. Sorry, and there we go. And I just wanted to make a comment that Annette Banis uh, took um, type two diamonds from Let's Sing and compared the uh, isotopic signatures with um, the micro diamonds from the, the same place, and uh, it. it that they gave two quite distinct signatures, which suggested that um, uh, the, 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 there was different size frequency. And in, so, um, you know, the big type twos don't seem to have a tail down to the small sizes. Um, it's, uh, uh, the, the, there's an abstract at the 11th Kimberlite conference in Gaberoni, if you want to have a look at that. But just some interesting data. So she, she was looking to see if you could um, look at the isotopic signatures and you know predict the presence of type twos. Um, preliminary study, but it, it suggested that you don't see the type twos in the fine grain size. Yeah. Um, well, when I did my first presentation in 2014 at Kimberley, uh, I was thrown in the deep end, and exactly this discussion about between the academics and the industry. Um, the um, mining companies about the whole concept of are micro diamonds actually related to macro diamonds? Um, empirically, obviously, it works for some, in some most cases because that's why they still do it. Um, but yes, uh, the mother nature can decide whatever she likes. Um, interestingly, something which I haven't mentioned because it's not yet um, clarified, I've got a, a research client in uh, Norway that is finding micro diamonds in deeply subducted volcanics and they are all the same size and they look like my synthetic diamond spikes. They are perfectly cuboctahedral, just over 0.75 microns in size. And the only reason why we know that it's not our spikes is that we've recovered all our spikes and there were 90 more that we didn't put in the sample. And he did not sample with the diamond drill bit, so there was no chance of contamination, um, which seems that these proto crystallites form under certain conditions. Um, and we are trying to zoom in and see if Raman analysis can maybe give us some chemical information on inclusions. But they are so small, it's very difficult to analyze these things. Um, so yes, diamonds um, sometimes cause us more questions than answers. Too often. Uh, yeah, I just want to chip in there on your comment, Andy. Um, that observation that micros and macros do not correspond um, in terms of the analytical quality and you know, any, anything that you care to analyze in them, whether it's carbon isotopes or, or nitrogen, um, nitrogen content or other, other things that you can measure in diamonds, that's not unique to type twos. This is uh, something that's, that's well known that, um, that micro diamond populations from an analytical point of view 
are not, do not necessarily correspond with macro diamond populations. And you can see that also in shape characteristics, in size, in, in, in color characteristics, and so on. What it means is that when you're looking at a micro diamond or a macro diamond population, you're looking at a blend of individual um, batches of diamonds. And it's a statistical approach. It's not an analytical approach. Um, and it causes a lot of problem. And this kind of conversation that, that Hilda uh, referred to between the academics and the people who use, who, who look at diamonds from a statistical point of view. These are two different views of the same world and they do not necessarily need to correspond. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's just part and parcel of the way we, we, we view diamonds. And the person who initially pointed this out was Derek Robinson. And he did so by studying diamond eclogites from Arapa. But, but just, to, just to carry on with that, Herman, I mean, there's enough um, um, sort of, what, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Not intuitive, but there's enough um, information now from many, many Kimberlites to suggest that, you know, there is a relationship somehow or other. Yes, there's a statistical relationship and it's, it's generally log normal, but you can actually see participate um, um, deviations from a log normal distribution where you get, you know, where you basically get a diamond parcel from an individual zenith. I gave a talk at the VKC about the, this kind of circumstance. Yeah. Um, and individual zeniths do not necessarily have a log normal size distribution. And when they pop up in your diamond analysis, in particular micro diamond analysis, they stand out as a spike. Um, and then when you go into the, the characteristics of that spike, you find out you've got yourself a unique batch of diamonds in your micro diamond sample that come from one zenolith. And that zenolith then does not correspond to the other zenoliths that you might have in the same sample. Yeah. So you get these nugget effects um, that are non-statistical and they are also anomalies in terms of of whatever you 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 end up analyzing them for, and, and I think it also goes back to you know you've talked about it and Mike talked about it um, you know in in this game of exploring and finding and evaluating kimberlites you know it, it's far better to use more than one technique and and one method, um, yeah. You know, and and we are fortunate today to have a you know, in most cases, not all, but a, you know, a whole range of, of tools that, that we can make use of. Yeah, yeah I, I was really just highlighting, um, I, I don't know enough about microdiamonds, but it's the only study that I know where they've taken them from a, a, a clipper producer and then tried to compare the, uh, you know, the signatures of the micros and the macros. But um, it does look as though, uh, you know, if you if you look at Debbie Bowen's um, work at the Ninth in International Kimberlite Conference, she points out that you get um, a much higher proportion of the big type two stones as you go to coarser sizes. So, um, so the the size distribution of the type two stones um, may not have any bearing on. Or, 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 or a comparison to that of the eclogitic and the peridotitic ones. But uh, anyway, I was just flagging a, a study that, um, you know, it, it, it's out there and it's, it's in, the, in the abstracts, um, if anyone wants to look at it. Yeah, and Andy, you, you're in Botswana. I mean, what, the one thing we really need one day is to someone, for someone to go and talk very nicely to the beers and do a... A, a study of the diamond population across the full range of their production, you know, from from the biggest to the smallest. Because if you see a layout of of you know, particularly Joining, you know, even the little diamonds look gorgeous. Thanks very much. That was um, a thoughtful and stimulating discussion. And 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 I guess Herman, you'll pick up on some of the the, the micro diamond, macro diamond. Um, correlations and so on in your in your
presentation tomorrow. Yeah, in fact, uh, I will use that exact same um, size distribution curve that Andy has just mentioned from Let's Sing as a kickoff to introduce the fact that you get different populations that are mixed in one diamond path. 